You know, as believers, we should always take the opportunity to tell others the story of Jesus. Love so amazing, this story I tell of love everlasting. Thought for himself And if someone should ask me why All I can say is That's just how he is Cause I don't know why No, I don't know why But I'm glad about it I'm glad about it And I never, never thought Someone Someone could love me so deeply No That's why I want to tell the world about it Wait a minute I must confess I used to take his love for granted but that's all in the past You see, after I understood what he did for me I couldn't treat him the same, you see And I don't know why he stays with me Oh, Lordy But that's just how he is Yes, that's how he is And I Savior, those evil men now. now. 
Greetings to you. We thank you for your listening to our broadcast for today. My name is Dr. David Penn. I am the senior minister of the Robbins Church of Christ here in the village of Robbins, Illinois. We're thankful for this expression of his grace and that he has allowed us to participate in this another day of living here on the planet Earth. We're going to share with you, beginning today, a series of lessons taken from the Ephesian epistle of the Apostle Paul. Our message today will emanate from Ephesians chapter 3. We will begin with verse number 14 and conclude with verse number 20. If you have a copy of the Word of God, we invite you to join in the reading with us. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 14 and concluding with verse number 20. And we find these words, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which patheth all understanding, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. I want to share with you the first message from this series today. And I'd like to invite your meditation to the subject, Paul's progress, or I should say Paul's prayer for spiritual progress. Paul's prayer for spiritual progress. I believe it is possible to know a great deal about an automobile and yet never use that knowledge to go anywhere at all. I believe it is also possible to know very little about an automobile and then use the little you know to travel hundreds of miles each day. In the same fashion, it is possible to know theologically and theoretically about the promises of prayer and yet never really experience the tremendous power of prayer. This is the idea that Paul addresses in the third chapter here in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15 through verse 23, we find the first prayer offered by Paul on behalf of the Ephesian believers. But in this third chapter, 
beginning with verse number 14 through verse 20. This is the second prayer that Paul makes on behalf of the Ephesian Christians. And so I'd like to look at three things from the text that we've read into your hearing. I want us to look at the source of our strength. Number two, the secret of our strength. And then number three, the supply of our strength. The source, the secret, and the supply of our strength. The first thing that Paul prays about in verse number 16 of Ephesians chapter 3, he prays that all of God's children might be strengthened. He says that he would grant unto you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. This verse actually pertains to the source of our strength. If you remember when Paul wrote his second letter to the church at Corinth. He expressed the belief that there are two natures in every believer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 16, the Bible says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inner man is renewed day by day. Every Christian, every baptized believer has at least, or I should say indeed, two natures. You have an outer man, and you also have an inner man. And I recognize the fact that man is a trichotomy consisting of body, soul, and spirit. But there are only two natures in every Christian. The outer man is that physical body. The outer man is what you see, feel, and, and touch. The outer man is visible and tangible and someone you can converse with. The outer man begins at birth and he concludes at death. But the inner man begins at the new birth. And unlike the outer man, the inner man never dies. He transcends our earthly mortality when we take off this mortality and put on immortality. The inner man will continue to live on and on and on. The moment you come to faith by accepting Christ in your life as Lord and Master, God plants within you a new nature. You become a new creation, made all over again. But you never lose the outward man. We never lose that old Adamic nature from our physical birth. But now we have two natures, one of which is flesh and the other 
which is spirit. In Romans chapter 7 verses 21 through verse 23, Paul speaks again concerning the inner conflict that goes on between the old and the new natures. And he says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. And in verse 21, he says, I find then a law. That whenever I would do good, evil is present with me. And that's why we find ourselves in the spiritual warfare and spiritual conflict of trying to do what is right and what God says. Whenever there is a struggle to do that which is right, that in itself is a sign of God's new nature being present. And it's not an easy fight. This is a fight to the finish. The devil won't quit and God has no intentions of quitting. It is only when we have this new nature that we are able to commune with God. It is only when we have this new nature that we can appreciate and understand spiritual things. So then the source of our strength comes by having a new nature through which we receive the riches of God's glory. Number two, not only does Paul talk about the source of our strength. He also talks about the secret of our strength. When we look at the B clause of verse 16 again of Ephesians 3, he says to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. When a person has been born again, God gives to that individual a new nature. But just as your physical body needs to grow and develop and mature, your spiritual life, that inner man, that inner person, he must also grow, develop, and mature. Just like your physical body needs food and exercise to stay healthy. Your inner man, your spiritual man needs spiritual food and exercise to stay healthy also. That's why you've got to get in the word and stay in the word. Meditate upon the word and then crucify yourself daily. The secret of our strength is the inexhaustible power of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse 17. Here in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now notice this, notice the progression of Paul's prayer for spiritual progress. First of all, he has prayed that they might be strengthened. And now he has prayed that they might be indwelt. And the word dwell found here in Ephesians 3.17 is used in the verb sense and it comes from a word which means to settle down permanently. It means to settle down and to settle in on a permanent basis. So the apostle is praying that Jesus won't just be a visitor or a passerby or a guest in your life. He won't just drop in on Sunday morning and then leave on Sunday night, but he will have a preeminent and permanent place in your heart all of the time. This is, this is interesting. 
At least it is to me. Because all through the New Testament scriptures, we find statements which talk about us being in Christ. Over and over again, you will hear it said, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Ephesians 1, 3, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Philippians 2 and 1, if there be any consolation in Christ. But now the process is reversed. Instead of just us being in Christ, he's talking about Christ being in you. And there is a difference. Oh, there's a difference to be in Christ and having Christ in you. To be in Christ means that you have been justified. For Christ to be in you means that you are being sanctified. There is a difference in your being in Christ and Christ being in you. And you can tell. You can tell whether or not a person has Christ in them because if Christ is in them, they will behave Christ-like. They will act Christ-like. They will think Christ-like. They will talk Christ-like. In other words, Christ being in you and you being in Christ is something which I call reciprocal indwelling. Let me give you an example of reciprocal indwelling. Uh, in John chapter 15, beginning at verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me. And I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Notice the branches are in the vine. But the vine is also in the branches. Reciprocal indwelling. We see it every day. The bird is in the air, and the air is in the bird, reciprocal indwelling. The fish is in the water, and the water is in the fish, reciprocal indwelling. The iron is in the fire, and the fire is in the iron. We are in Christ, but Christ must be in us, reciprocal indwelling. And this is Paul's prayer for progressive sanctification. Uh, it's a prayer for not only the Ephesian believers, but for all of God's children to bring their belief in line with their behavior, to bring your doctrine in line with your duty, to bring your worship in line with your work. So it's not enough for you just to say that I am a member of the Lord's church. You've got to develop. You've got to mature. You've got to grow up so that you can become a more progressive Christian. Paul says, my prayer for you is that Christ will have a preeminent and permanent place in your life and that he might dwell in your hearts by faith. This is a sanctifying message with a very simple means. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
For they that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that will earnestly or diligently seek him. And then Paul moves on a little bit further in verse 17. He says here, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now watch this. Paul prayed, first of all, that they might be strengthened. Paul prays, secondly, that they might be indwelt. And now he is praying that they might be rooted and grounded in love. I don't know if you've ever noticed it or not, but it is impossible to grow up until you have first grown down. I said it's impossible to grow up until you have first grown down. Paul is calling for a deeper faith and a delightful fervor among the people of God. You may not be able to figure out how God is going to do it, but you know because of the deepness of your faith that God will. Can't explain it. But I just know because I know that I know that I know. Have you noticed that before plants and trees and even grass, before it grows up, it's got to first grow down. No plant, no tree is considered to be healthy if it does not have healthy roots. Before any plant can sprout, and grow up underneath the ground, it must first grow down. And in like manner, before you can grow up in the Lord, you got to grow down in the Lord. In other words, you got to have a deep faith. Too many of us have only a shallow, superficial faith. Yeah, superficial, shallow. But when you have a deeper faith, you can say to yourself and to anybody else, let the storm rise. Let the winds of adversity blow. Let the disturbing winds of disappointment present itself. I shall not be moved. And that's why, that's why the psalmist says in Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of God, and in his law doth he meditate both day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth fruit, and whatsoever he doeth, he shall prosper. He said, you got to be like a tree which is planted, not just a tree, but a tree that has been planted, a tree that has a purpose, a tree that has direction. You've got to be like a tree. 
that has been planted and that will not be moved in spite of the circumstances that may present themselves. When, when, when you are like a tree that has been planted by design and that's by God. You're going to need care. You're going to need nurturing. You're going to need assistance. But after you've been growing up, after you've been growing up and down, you become strong enough to do some things. You won't be easily overtaken by the enemy because you've been rooted in the soil of the earth. When you spend quality time with the Lord every day, when you walk with a consistent obedience to God's will and God's way, you're putting down some roots that will enable you to remain stable. You won't need the preacher to make you happy. Because your roots are in the soil of Jesus. And you can draw from his abundant resources. Yeah, our faith needs to be rooted and grounded, especially in times like these. You know, one of the things that, that, that bothers me with a whole lot of people, uh, especially when it comes to religion, is that oftentimes they allow themselves to get caught up with every wind of doctrine. Yeah. But the call that Paul prays for is that we might be rooted and grounded in the word and not so much by tradition. When you are rooted and got good roots, won't well, nobody cause you to leave the faith. So Paul says, be planted, be rooted, and be grounded. He says, you need to be planted. You need to be rooted, you need to be grounded, so that you might be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and depth, and height. Now, let me, let me be realistic. None of us will ever know all there is to know about God in this life. We cannot comprehend the incomprehensible. We cannot measure the immeasurable. The finite cannot fathom the infinite and mortality does not fully understand immortality. But I tell you one thing, we can praise God that there are some things we can understand. We can understand the extent of his divine love because the love of God is found everywhere and in every experience we have ever had to encounter. The love of God is found in the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of our human existence because we are here. It demonstrates the love of God. The extent of his love reaches to where both you and I live. Somebody once said that his love reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. His love picks us up when we are down, places our feet 
on a higher ground. His love. It saves us when we cannot save ourselves. It gives us strength when we are weak. It gives us peace when we are confused. It gives us hope in every trial. The love of God puts joy in our heart, a smile on our face, stability in our steps, and a twinkle in our eyes. Because there's never been a mountain that God could not move. There's never been a hurt that God could not heal. There's never been a storm that God could not steal or a problem that God could not solve. I tell you, the extent of God's love is everywhere. And finally, as I come to a close for this first message in Ephesians, I want to talk about the supply of our strength. Yeah, we've, we've talked about the source, and we've talked about the secret, and now I want to say a word about the supply of our strength. Look at, look at Ephesians 3, 19, and, and I like the way Paul has laid this out for our understanding uh, you don't need to be a theologian to understand much of this third chapter. He says here again, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul's final request in this second mighty prayer. I told you this is the second prayer. First prayer is found in Ephesians chapter 1. In his, this, this third chapter, in his second prayer, for spiritual progress, he is praying for every child of God to follow God's perfect pattern. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to read this again. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul is praying that all of us will follow God's perfect pattern. And you do know that Jesus Christ is the perfect pattern of fullness as it relates to God. Everything about Jesus was complete. He was completely God. He was completely man. He is God of the very God. He was a supreme example of ultimate perfection. And that's why we have to make Jesus our goal. I don't have time measuring to measure myself against you. You don't have time to measure yourself against me. We ought to be measuring ourselves against Jesus, who is the captain of our salvation. In Ephesians 1 verse 19, uh, the Bible says, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And in Colossians 2 and 9, Paul reminds us that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I told you before that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He is as much God as the Father and the Holy Spirit. But it's not enough for the Lord to just be in your life. You got to make sure that the Lord is in control of your life. When the Lord is in control, your attitudes will change. 
Your thoughts will be pure. Your hearts will be moved. Your soul will rejoice. When the Lord is in control, you have a blessed aspiration, a confident expectation, a guided determination, and a glorious anticipation. I said, when the Lord is in control, you will share Christ with somebody. You can speak to everybody. You will love anybody when the Lord is in control. When Christ is your Lord, when he's your master, you will not fret yourself because of evildoers and the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. When the Lord is in control. We have an assurance that keeps us, an anchor that secures us, a defense that consoles us, and a refuge that sustains us when the Lord is in control. So this is Paul's prayer for spiritual progress on our behalf. He wants us to recognize where our strength is. He wants us to understand who our source is. And he wants us to understand where our supply is. That we might be rooted and grounded in love. Amen. We invite you to share with us again in part two of this series from the book of Ephesians, you can find us at www.robinschurchofchrist.org. If you would care to contribute to this ministry, there is a contribution link that you can click on, and we will gladly be appreciative of your assistance in this matter. So may God bless you and keep you in the providence of his care. May he continue to extend upon you his beneficent grace and his enriching mercy. And let us never forget again that grace, grace gives us what we don't deserve and mercy keeps from us what we do deserve. May God bless you real good. Wings to veil my face, I want to yeah. wings, wings to veil my feet, I want two oh, wings, two oh, wings oh, to fly away. Yeah. I, know I know the world can't do me no harm. Two wings, I want two wings, two wings just to veil my face. I want two wings, two wings to veil my feet. I want two wings, two wings to fly away. I know the world can't do me no harm. Two wings, I want two wings, two wings just to veil my face. I want two wings. Two wings to veil my feet. I want two wings, two wings to fly away. I know the world, the world can't do me no harm. Listen to me now. One of these old mornings, and it won't be long. No. You look around, look around here for me, but I'll be going on home with two wings. Two wings, two wings, just to veil my face. I want two wings, two wings, just to veil my feet. I want two wings, two wings, just to fly away. I know the world, the world can't do me no harm. Wait a minute, meet me, Jesus, meet me in the middle of the air. Yeah, if these two wings should fill me. I want you to meet me with another pair Two wings, two wings, two wings To veil my face I want two wings, two wings To veil my feet I want two wings, two wings I'm gonna fly away I know the world can't do me no harm Hey, up in glory I've got a long white robe Oh, me under a new pair of shoes but most of all, I've got a long pair of wings. I'll fly away, spread the news. Two wings, two wings, two wings to veil my face. Two wings, two wings to 
will not be too late, too late to fly away. I know the world, the world can't do me no harm. They can try to, but the world, the world can't do me no harm. I know the world, world can't do me no harm. Hey, hey. <laughs> One of these old mornings, and it won't be long. No. You look around for me, but I'll be gone on home. Can I get my wings? Two wings to build my feet. Can I get wings? Two wings to build my feet. Two wings, two wings to fly away. I know the world can't do me no harm. Oh, beyond I know the world can't do me no harm. I'm gonna go where the world can't do me no harm. I want to live for you, yes, and I want to work for you, I want to give all of my all to you, you've done so much, hey, for me, and I know I can never repay you, Lord, but whatever you need, I'm willing to be, whatever you want from me, hey, you can ask of me, and I want to live for you. My heart and soul for me. I would not change. Said I wouldn't change one thing about my life. Now that you come in, and say I'm strange. My friends say I'm acting kind of strange, but they don't really understand my change. See how can they know? And how can I explain it? See, I'm in love with the man The man that holds the whole world in his hand yeah. And whatever he needs I'm willing to be That's what I tell him Whatever he wants Whatever he wants from me hey, He can ask of me And I In your fall for, for you, you. Ooh, and oh, I, I want to give. I'm trying to live like you. I want to be able to you give like you. So much. You've done so much for me. For hey, me. you've done so much for you've me. Done so much. You've done so much for me. For me. And whoa, whoa, that's why I want to live for you. I I want to work for you. I want to work for you. I want to give, like give like you. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. I want to give for you. I want to live for you. I want to live for you.